I'm really pleased for us to be able to try and kind of bring some of the themes that we've heard this morning in the keynote speeches to, to kind of back to the network. And, and, and actually, as Claire's referenced on, on many occasions, the network is us. So actually, the work that, that we are able to produce, the things that we're able to influence, actually comes from the people in the room. It's not from somebody sitting on a board somewhere else. Um, and I, I was really struck this morning. I mean, I, I, I saw the, the um, premiere of Upload um, when it was um, on at the Corner House, and it made me cry then. It made me cry again this morning. Last year, we watched an inspirational piece that actually was about education, not about psychological professions. I think you'd agree with me. We've watched an inspirational piece today that was about psychological professions. Um, and, and Eddie's journey in that really struck a chord with me because I think what was really clear is the part that we see as psychological professions is only one aspect of that person's life at any one point in time. There's lots of other things that are, are going on as well. I'm hoping this is going to work. So we, we kind of worked out that we would call this the, the sort of uh, five Ps. So we're trying to draw together the public health bit, the prevention bit, parity of esteem, and of course the two Ps that are in the PPN. Um, and we were looking at that sort of issue that people, people who have a sense of, of some control over their lives um, are more successful and more able to affect change in their lives. And I think Eddie's story this morning showed really clearly how when you feel you've no control over what's happening to you, it's absolutely overwhelming. And it can really set you on a downward spiral. And I guess our, our, our theme for this afternoon is how do we help people come out of that position and, and gain more efficacy? And I guess the three themes that also came out to me this morning were around clinical leadership, because every one of us in the room is a clinical lead in some way, shape, or capacity. Um, we have a responsibility around the psychological workforce and what we do and help to equip people coming through the profession as well, but also give ourselves the right skills, give ourselves the opportunities to step out for a bit and hear what's going on in, in other areas such as public health. And I guess that really huge thing about the wider social determinants um, of health. So we, we had a little model um, here that really sort of brings to life some of the things that Gregor was saying, but I also thought if that was Eddie in the middle, we might be able to populate some of those areas in a clearer way than, than you would just see in, in an hour's therapeutic session, but which are things that will be really important in terms of helping someone gain that sort of self-efficacy, to know about that, to know what else is happening in that person's life, to know what influences them. And in this diagram, it's all done in a very nice sort of equal sort of pieces of the cheese there with physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, sexual and social. But actually what we do know is that that, that sort of nice um, equal split isn't how things are um, across the board. And that's kind of why we're starting with um, parity. Um, and I think we do know that there is there is a lot of stigma still out there. And I think what was really clear in the, in the film this morning as well is how much that becomes a barrier to people actually being able to access things that are going to help them. Um, I thought there were some brilliant bits in it when you saw the workforce colleagues who were understanding up to a point but still offered a lot of stigma. You know, there's a lot of stigma about saying that you're going off sick even. Um, a lot of stigma then is saying that you're going off sick with a mental health issue. A lot of stigma about accessing help. A lot of stigma about saying that you've actually got to the point where you feel like committing suicide. Um, and, and I know a colleague of mine, Mary, and I were discussing last week about a, a kind of a sort of public health campaign that um, is going on in Stockport, where actually some of the leading people in the, the council, in uh, the local mind, have talked about their own personal stories and put those own personal stories out there as people in positions of influence, which I just thought, what a brave thing to do. But actually, if more people did that, then, then we wouldn't have the issue about stigma that we have. I guess the other bit for me that always comes into mind is that parity of esteem about uh, the imbalance between mental and physical health in terms of the spend, in terms of the fact that it's taken us so long to get a mental health tariff. Um, also, in the fact that uh, people with mental health issues die younger. I know Gregor was saying, let's not mention all the statistics to rabble rouse, but actually that's one that absolutely is inescapably shocking that actually you're more likely to die of smoking-related problems than you are of suicide if you have a mental health problem. So it's a disgrace, and it's something that we need to do something about. 
But the second one, though, the professional stigma, I think is also a very big issue. Um, and, and I'm really struck by this. And, and again, I, I, as people know, it's a subject I'm very passionate about, is breaking down that professional stigma. On the news yesterday, there was a lot of discussion about the child sexual exploitation cases, about people talking to professionals about their experience of being exploited and not being heard. Um, and that seems to me absolutely appalling. And I'm sure it's appalling to, to those of you in the room who've listened to first disclosures to think that somebody would take that disclosure and actually do nothing with it, or even worse, cover it up. So I do think there is something about us really challenging some of that professional stigma and not pigeonholing our patients um, and not believing their accounts. But also, I think there's that issue, but it's pretty despicable that we think of all the people that um, the... the contacts with the health service every day, that million contacts every day, where no one asks about their mental health or no one asks about how you actually feeling about the care that you're receiving. So my rabble rising done, I'm going to uh, pass you over to Anna, who's from the BACP, and they've done a really good piece of consultation work on parity of esteem. <coughs> Good afternoon. Um, so today I'm going to talk and about the, our project that we did. Uh, it took place in 2014, however there are summaries on the table. And I'm going to talk about the context and the content of the report. So this was BACP's Psychological Therapies and Parity of Esteem report. Parity of esteem between mental and physical health is an abstract concept which has been utilised in the rhetoric of politicians and policy makers without there being any substance to this. And so the aim of BACP's report, therefore, was to articulate what parity of esteem could and should mean for psychological therapies in the NHS. Other organisations, it's worth noting, such as the BMA or the Royal College of Psychiatrists, have also produced reports examining the impact of parity of esteem more broadly. So the process. BACP conducted the project in 2014 from April to December. The project initially consisted of an external stakeholder seminar with a range of organisations attending an event at the Royal College of Physicians. In attendance were the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the AMRC and the Royal College of Nursing. To articulate how parity of esteem should be, should be meant towards psychological therapies, BACP then invited these external stakeholders to substantiate their claims with evidence responding to a call for evidence. This then informed a consultation and questionnaire for both BACP members and service users. Uh, we contacted NSUN um, and utilised their networks there to gain contact with service users. BACB considered it essential to understand what practitioners and service users had of their first-hand experiences of disparity in the NHS and what solutions could be found to overcome this. These resources were utilised to write the report which was launched on the 3rd of December at the Houses of Parliament. In attendance was the Minister for Care, Norman Lamb, and James Morris, the Chair of the APPG for Mental Health, and also in attendance were members from the Labour Shadow Cabinet as well. So politicians are really engaged with this kind of concept, whether it's just parity of esteem or whole person care. So it's really, really important piece, of, piece politically. So you can find the complete report on the BACP website, and hopefully I'll be able to circulate it after the event today. However, like I've said, there are summaries on your tables. So the key themes that arose from the, our consultation process were access, waiting times, choice, funding, services, and staff, and research. I'm going to discuss two themes in greater detail as they were interlinked with the work of PPN and demonstrate the role the network can have in promoting parity of esteem. So parity of esteem in relation to staff and services was a key theme that emerged from our parity consultation process. Professional standards are rigorously maintained and supported in the physical health care within the NHS, yet our consultation process found that this was an area of mental health care that was overlooked by the NHS. The ACP therefore recommended that all psychological therapies provided and funded by the NHS and delivered by practitioners that have appropriate training and professional registration. Another contributor to disparity in, in healthcare is clinicians being unable to diagnose and or know what treatment to provide patients with mental health problems. For example, the BMA in their parity report stated that mental health training for student doctors is limited and work needs to be done in this area. However, this is, a, as we all know, this isn't only a problem for patients who present with mental health problems. 
I'm going to be again throw out some more statistics that in England, 15 million people have a long term condition, a physical condition, a third of whom will have a comorbid mental health condition such as anxiety and depression. The ACP therefore recommended that all clinicians should be trained to understand both mental and physical health and their interdependencies. And those who prescribe and refer people should, for treatment should have an understanding of psychological therapies and have an understanding of local provision. This was a statement that 81% of our own members agreed with. This is reflected in PPN's aim to ensure that health and psychological professions in the Northwest are supported by high quality education and lifelong learning. But what can PPN do to specifically promote awareness of mental health and promote psychological therapies to health practitioners? Additionally, how could PPN facilitate developing physical health knowledge for psychological therapy practitioners themselves? Disparity between mental health and health research was another key theme that emerged from our consultation. Despite mental health problems counting for 23% of the disease burden in the UK, mental health research is only 5.5% of the spending. Within that, 15 is, only 15% is spent on researching psychological therapies. Addition, additionally, there's also disparity on the research of comorbid diseases and the disease burden in comparison to that. As a result, BACP made a range of recommendation, research recommendations, including strengthening the links between organisations to identify and prioritise areas of research in psychological therapies, and that all research should recognise and consider the impact of interdependencies between their fields, such as housing and mental health. PPN already aims to promote and develop research and innovation in psychological therapies and developing capacity within the workforce. But what role can PPM play in promoting research into the independencies between mental health and a range of other fields? Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, sorry, we, we just need to correct that it's Anna Lewis. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's too many Claire's and too many Anna's, that's the problem. So it, it, I'm sure we can get access to the document as well, Anna, can't we, which we will, we will put on the PPN website. Um, so there's a, there's a real issue there for what can we contribute as the PPN. And um, the idea is that we're now going to move into the sort of workshop element of the afternoon. And I'd like us to kind of bear in mind all of the things that we've heard through the keynote speeches, and obviously, particularly those issues that, that Anna's raised around the, the staff and the research elements, but also the animation as well and what it can contribute and, and how we might be able to use it to get across our message to a wider, a wider population.